Take your Bible, if you would, and look to the fourth chapter of John's Gospel, and we'll begin our study tonight by looking at some of the information that is contained there. We've been studying since last evening the subject of spirituality, and we're trying to ascertain just how important this is to the life of of all of us who are Christians. And we made the point last night that it's not just something we could be if we wanted to be, it's something we absolutely must be in order to be pleasing to God. So we're not talking about something to be nice if we could achieve it. We're not talking about something that only a few select people are able to actually pull off in this lifetime. We're talking about what God's expectations are for those of us who are trying to grow into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now tonight, I want to talk with you about spiritual worship. And I think that uh, you already are probably ahead of me thinking about what I might be saying about that subject. And we're going to probably say some things tonight that will be familiar to you. We're going to say some things that for some folks might not be so familiar. But I hope that as we zero in on this particular aspect of our spirituality that we'll come to see how vital worship in all of its forms is to those who are trying to be like Christ and to develop spiritually as they ought. In the fourth chapter of John's Gospel there is the record here of the time when Jesus weary from travel going up to Samaria had stopped at a well in that particular province and he approached a woman who had come to that well to draw water. And he asked that woman for a simple drink of water because he was thirsty. I guess he was all so hungry, but his disciples had gone into the city to try to find something for them to eat. And so while they were over at Burger King or McDonald's getting their sacks and bringing them back out so they could all have something to eat, he sat down by the curbing of that very ancient well that had belonged to their Father Joseph in antiquity. And there he initiated a conversation with this woman regarding spiritual things. In verse 10, Jesus answered her and said that if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus is going to talk to her about living water as opposed to the water that she's just drawn from that well and shared with Jesus because he needs to slake his thirst. And she said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, verse 11, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. You see, he's trying to interest her in what he has to offer. She's given him a drink, but he has living water to offer her and the metaphor that he's using there is something she really doesn't understand. But before this conversation is finished, she's going to have a pretty good idea of what it is. Well, as we move through the text, what we find is that Jesus begins to discuss this woman's personal issues in life with her. In particular, he's going to address some of her marriage difficulties. And in verse 16, he said to her, Go call your husband and come here. And the woman said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. Well, she's amazed, of course, that Jesus knows enough about her, having just met her, that he knows exactly what her marital situation is. That she's now just living with a man who's not her husband at all. That she's had five previous marriages and she's never met this man. And as far as she knows, she's a total stranger to him. And so this causes her to conclude that the person to whom she's now speaking is not just an ordinary Jew. He's not just an ordinary traveler through Samaria. He's not even just an ordinary teacher. Because in verse 19 she said to him, Sir, 
I perceive that you are a prophet. And then she had a question on her mind that she wanted to ask a man who was as qualified to answer that question as a prophet would be. The woman asked the question. She said, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. You people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. I'll tell you when Jesus answers this lady's questions about the proper place for worship. She was looking at Mount Gerizim there in Samaria and she knew that her ancestors had worshipped there for generations. She knew that the Jews didn't approve of that and she knew that the Jews thought that Jerusalem was the only place that acceptable worship could be offered. And may I suggest to you that under the law of Moses that's exactly right. It was in Jerusalem where God had placed his name. It was at the temple that had been built by God's authorization in Jerusalem where the sacrifices could be made and where the singing could be done and where the prayers could be offered and where the priests went about doing the work that had been prescribed for them to do under the law of Moses. They're still living under the dispensation of the law of Moses and Jerusalem was the place where God was to be worshipped. Yes, there were altars that were probably all over Samaria. There were altars that were probably in other sections of the nation of Israel. But the only legitimate altar for burnt offering was there before the temple of God in Jerusalem. I don't know how much thought you've ever given to Old Testament worship. We study them, passages, books like Deuteronomy, like Numbers, like Leviticus, a little bit out of the book of Exodus and we get a good bit of information about what worship involved, what service at the tabernacle initially and then ultimately at the temple would have uh, been about. But one of the things that impresses me about Old Testament worship is that it appealed to a lot of very physical sights and sounds and circumstances. When you think about worship at the temple, the first thing that's going to strike you is going to be the special clothing that these priests would wear that set them apart from every other person that was on that property. You didn't have to wonder who was in charge here because those priests dressed in vestments that was not something common people wore. And they were ornately done, especially that high priest's garment. And I'm sure that when the people could see the high priest's garment, that was a spectacular sight to them. And it would have been a beautiful thing to behold from the descriptions that we have of it given in Exodus and Leviticus and other places. I'll tell you that it was not only the robe priests as they were the mediators between the worshiper and God. But I think about that ornate garment of the high priest and I think about those animal sacrifices. You know, we get ready on Sundays and we come to services and even tonight we've come together to worship and nobody had to get dirty to do it. Nobody had to worry about blood. Nobody had to worry about an animal flailing around on the dirt. Nobody had to think about bringing a horse trailer <laughs> and parking it in the lot out there so you could get your livestock and bring it in and actually slaughter it. And do the things prescribed by law in order for that to be done. Let me tell you that the sight of that and the smells that were associated with that. And the circumstances surrounding offering those animal sacrifices would be something you would never forget. They would be emblazoned into your thinking because those are things that you just have to exercise your physical senses really to appreciate. You think about a worshiper coming and laying his hands on the head of an animal that was to have his sins transferred to that animal that was going to be slaughtered and you're personally confessing your sins over that animal who's going to give his life. I think about the smells of the incense that was burned there at the tabernacle. 
and of course at the temple, wherever this worship was offered. It would appeal to the sense of smell. And I think about that animal blood that was going to be taken and sprinkled over the altar. And how that there'd be blood that would just be everywhere. It just would not be possible for, for blood not to be everywhere under the circumstances under which they would have worshipped at that particular time. Very meticulously they would go about these particular tasks. And I think that later on in the days of David, of course, they add instrumental music to the worship. And there are not only instrumentalists, but there are also trained choirs that are able to provide music and it would have been a beautiful thing to hear and it would have uh, utilized uh, circumstances that would appeal to your physical ear and to the aesthetic qualities that all human beings sometimes appreciate. And yet Jesus said, all that's going to change. He said there was a time when our fathers might have worshipped in this way. He said, but the time is coming and it now is it's upon us is what he's saying when those who are going to worship the father must worship him in spirit and they must worship him in truth because that's what God is seeking because he's a spirit himself and he's not really helped by all of these physical things yes those things he prescribed but he had envisioned this change of the way in which people would go about bringing their worship and this was not going to be a simple change. It was not going to be an easy change. It was going to be much more complex, really, than the bringing in of an animal or the sprinkling of blood or the wearing of certain garments or training a choir to sing or the instruments that they would bring in for those kinds of uh, musical services because it was going to have to involve something much more, well, may we say ethereal, Something that wasn't so physical, something that had no smell, something that had no taste, something that had no touch to it whatsoever. You know, when you think about that verse in verse 24, where he said that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I imagine that most of you here tonight are thinking to yourself, yes, I know what that means. I've had people at work that have asked me, about worship and I've gone to John 4 and verse 24 and I've said to them that we need to worship God in spirit and in truth and our usual explanations of those passages have pointed out that to worship according to truth obviously involves worshiping according to the Word of God and who here cannot quote John 17 17 Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so we conclude that what we're reading here is God saying to us that if you're going to worship me in truth, that means you worship me according to the word of God. I believe that's true. I don't have any doubt that that's true. But I think Jesus had something a little deeper in mind. I think there was a little something more to this than just make sure you can read about what you're doing in worship in Scripture and see how people that were approved by God worshiping in Scripture worshiped and do the things that they did. I believe that's so. But I believe there's more to it than that. I believe that the truth here has reference, obviously, to knowing who it is that we are bringing our worship to. We have to have a true comprehension of the God that we are offering worship in order for our worship to be spiritual. There are many people who through the ages have attempted to worship God, but in reality they have only worshipped their own image of who this God is. In Acts the 17th chapter, verses 22 and 23, I mentioned verse 22 last night where Paul said, that as he came through the city of Athens, he observed that those people there were very religious. Some translations say superstitious instead of religious. But in verse 23, he went on to tell them that he came into their city and observed that they were worshiping very many different idols and that he had even seen in their city an idol to the unknown God. And he said, I have come to Athens so that I can proclaim 
that God to you so that you can no longer hide behind the fact that we might be ignorant of that God, but we want to make sure he's covered so we put up a little idol over here in order to honor him. He says, I want you to know something about that God. You have been ignorantly worshiping him. I want you to worship him truthfully. I want you to know who he is. My friends, I think that this is exactly what happens with Muslims today. You know, our Muslim friends worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So do we. They worship Jehovah God. They understand that that is the creator of heaven and earth. They understand that he is the one who gave the law to Moses. They understand that he was the one who spoke to Abraham in the long ago. They understand that Isaac received some promises. They know who Jacob was in the scheme of things. But may I suggest to you that they have had additional information given them by some of their leaders that have given them a picture of God that is very different than the picture that we get in the Bible. Now, they are not idolaters, and we're grateful for the fact that they are not idolaters, but the prophet Muhammad and the book known as the Quran have misled them. And may I suggest to you that if you have an improper concept of God, that it will always lead you to an improper worship of him. This is why we must know what we worship. And did Jesus not say that to that Samaritan woman? He said, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. The Samaritans had a wrong concept of who God was. They may have been trying to serve the same God that their Jewish neighbors were serving, but they were serving him wrongly. They had built their own temple. They had uh, formed their own priesthood. They had gotten rid of the rest of the Old Testament other than those first five books, the Law of Moses. And outside of that, they were doing nothing that the ancient Israelites were taught to do. Jesus said that there's going to be a change. He also said that this worship must be offered in spirit. And again, when we usually try to explain quickly to some friend who is asking us about this passage, we will usually say, well, now what that means is, is that we need to have our heart in what we're doing. <laughs> How many times have I heard that explanation given? Teach a Bible class, say to somebody, okay, we're to worship God in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? Somebody will say, well, we really need to mean it when we do it. Our spirit needs to be in it. Is that true? Yes, it's true. There are a lot of different passages we could go to tonight that say that we have to do more than just go through the motions. We have to do more than just be physically present where worship's taking place in order for us to truly worship. Yes, no question. But I think again, Jesus has something a little bit different in mind when he says that we must worship according to spirit. No question that we must worship with our hearts, but it may very well be that we have missed a deeper meaning here in this passage. I believe that what we're looking at is a statement from Jesus that tells us that the Spirit of God must control what we do as we worship. We must worship through the Word of God revealed by the Holy Spirit, controlling what we are doing as we worship together. That's what worshiping in spirit is really all about as far as I am concerned. You know, what did Jesus have in mind here? Now you might remember that last night, if you were with us, that we talked about the fact that man is really not just a dichotomy, he is a trichotomy. There is body and there's soul and there's spirit. And we could argue that there's no difference between soul and spirit, but let's say for the moment, for the sake of argument, that 1 Thessalonians 5.23 isn't just repeating a word for emphasis, but he's trying to say that there is such a distinction to be made, as Hebrews 4 and verse 12 also indicates, between soul and spirit. So we are a trichotomy of body and soul and spirit. And we remember what the body is. The body is the flesh, this physical house in which we live, not evil within itself. The soul last night we identified as being the part of man that is the mental part of man. The part of man that is the intellectual and the emotional part of man. And that the spirit has to do with, with his sense of ought. It has to do with his conscience. It has to do with him knowing that there's something beyond him that should govern and guide us in our lives. 
And we noted that it's entirely possible for a person to live their lives on each of those planes. Some people live for the body, some people are governed by their emotions and their intellect, and then there are other people that are living for spiritual things. They're looking for the things of the spirit. And we observe that the spirit must dominate our soul. The spirit must dominate our body. It must come out the winner, as we might say, if we're going to worship God acceptably and please him. The Holy Spirit of God must work in conjunction with our human spirits if we're going to be spiritually minded. And when we allow, my brethren, ourselves to be led by the Spirit of God, and let me state again for emphasis that that does not happen miraculously. That does not happen directly. But as far as I can ascertain, it happens through the word that he has given to us. May I suggest to you that when that occurs, the Holy Spirit is controlling our worship. How does the Holy Spirit control our worship? Well, in the first place, the Holy Spirit reveals God so that we can know who God is. You know, we could know God from nature, couldn't we? Does the Bible teach that? Isn't it true that the Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God and that the earth shows His handiwork? Every once in a while, there'll be some brother that won't be coming to services on Sunday mornings in the spring of the year, and you find out he's gone fishing. And when you talk to him about it, he'll say something like, well, you know, I can get closer to God out there on the lake than I can in a church building. I mean, look at all this beauty. Look at all this power. Look at all this marvelous creation out here. It just makes me think about God. I said, yes, and those big old bass frying in a skillet are also things that you've got on your mind about that time too, aren't they? But the point I'm making here is, is that yes, we can know something about God from nature, but there are a lot of other important things about God you won't learn from nature. In fact, from nature alone, we might not know anything about the mercy of God or the love of God. Just let a tornado rip through Texas and see how the news responds to that when people are interviewed about having their houses blown away and they blame God for it and they claim that the weather out there was sent by God and that God's the one that blew their house away and I'm telling you God gets blamed for a lot of things that God doesn't have any direct intervention in at all. And you would find people thinking that if they just looked at nature Here's a hurricane that comes into the Gulf of Mexico and rips Houston apart. And here is an earthquake that may cause an entire city almost to fall into a big crevice somewhere. And people could look at nature and from that they might conclude that God is capricious. They might conclude that God is just dangling us out here. That God is just trying to see how difficult he can make it upon us. But my friends, it's the Holy Spirit's revelation of God. It's the Holy Spirit's revelation of God that stirs worship within us. Because of the instruction, you see, of the Holy Spirit right here, we know that God is worthy to be praised. We know that He is worthy to be adored and to be worshipped because it's the Scriptures, not nature, it's the Scriptures that address the love of God and the power of God and the omnipotence of God. And when we learn those things from Scripture, we are filled with admiration for a God like this. Think about the fact that the Scriptures are the source of information about all of the accomplishments of God. Yes, people say, I can know more about God from nature than I can learn about Him from a church meeting. But I will tell you that just looking at the world around you is not going to help you know anything about how it actually came to be. And it's not going to tell you anything about what God has at times done when He destroyed His creation because of sin. And then the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is not something you're going to learn sitting out on a mountainside somewhere looking across the vista and trying to figure out how in the world did all of this stuff come to be. We adore a God that is powerful enough to accomplish the things that Scripture teaches us that He actually did. The Scriptures revealed by the Holy Spirit inform me of God's plan for my life. How else would I know about God's interest in redeeming me eternally if it weren't for the Holy Spirit's work right here? 
I would not know about the plan of salvation. I would not know about God's interest in my spirit if it were not for the work of the Holy Spirit. And we praise God for all of His benefits toward us. And may I say to us that when you are a spiritually minded person, you will have to express yourself in worship when you see the true God as He is revealed in this book. You'll fall down on your knees. You'll recognize that this is not anything ordinary. It is indeed extraordinary that God would do these things and do them also in our behalf. But secondly, let me suggest to you that the Holy Spirit controls our worship by revealing to us two proper ways by which our adoration of God may be expressed. And the one most familiar to us in this discussion would be what we call assembly worship, much like what we have engaged in here tonight and certainly what we have done on the Lord's Day as we came together and ate the Lord's Supper together and gave of our means and did other things that sometimes we do not do in circumstances like we're in tonight. I would direct your attention just for a moment to the book of 1 Corinthians because there are several different indications in the book of 1 Corinthians about the importance and the necessity of an assembly of God's people coming together for worship. In the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, in verse 18, Paul speaks of the fact that there are times when the Christians at Corinth come together as a church. The Campbell Road Church exists even when it's not assembled in this meeting place. It's sort of a distributive sense in that you're still a church, but you're never more of a church than when everybody is all together and when we're in the same place and we've come together as an assembly. Same information is really kind of mentioned there in verse 20 when he said, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. The Corinthians were meeting together all right, but what they were doing with the Lord's Supper turned it into something besides what God had in mind about the Lord's Supper. But I'm trying to get out of that the idea that there is such a thing in God's mind as an assembly of the church. That there is a place where people assemble to actually worship. And you know, when you read about the Lord's Supper there in chapter 11, and that they needed to be doing that when they came together as a church, you could flip over to the 14th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, and down in verse 15 he said, I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the mind also. And he says, otherwise, if you bless in the Spirit, how will one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you're saying? Implied in this is the fact that this is not a private prayer at home that nobody hears. This is a prayer that you may be praying in the context of other people listening, and being able to say their own amen to that, giving their assent to what you have just prayed. He's talking about prayers in an assembly of a local church, as far as I can tell. And teaching is obviously a part of all of this. And we know that teaching is a part of all of this because we read over in the 14th chapter also and in verse 26, what is the outcome then, brethren, when you assemble each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. And then the rule was, everything done in that assembly should be done for edification. That's the purpose of it, to build people up spiritually. To help them to grow into Christ. To help them to know God even better than they have known Him. And then you can go over to the 16th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And he's speaking there about what they also did as they would come together as a church concerning the collection for the saints, he said. As I directed the churches of Galatia, you do this also. This is a commandment, by the way. He, he says, I've, I've given an order to the Galatian brethren and I'm telling you to do what I told them to do. That on the first day of the week, let each one of you uh, lay something aside and, and do that as you prosper so that there will not have to be a collection taken when I come to you. It just seems to me that these are the things that they did in these assemblies. Now you might find other things that they did in those assemblies. I could add some things to that list that they did in the assemblies. I'm not stuck on just those five things. 
But I know for a fact that those five things were the things that they did in an assembly together in which they were expressing their adoration to God. But my friends, none of those actions are worshipful within themselves. Do we understand that? Have there not been instances in which you have eaten the Lord's Supper, but you could honestly have to say, I did not worship as I did that. My mind was somewhere besides where it ought to have been. Have there been times when you have allowed songs to come from your mouth that, that you really didn't think about, you didn't understand what you were singing, you weren't even thinking about what you were doing because your mind was somewhere else on something else? You know, Jesus in Matthew chapter 15 and verses 8 and 9 says it's possible to worship emptily, possible to worship vainly. You can do that by teaching for doctrine the commandments of men, but that's perhaps not the only thing that you can do. It grieves God. It disturbs our God, I believe, for us to be so haphazard and for our actions to be so empty and so meaningless when we come together in these assemblies. But brethren, coming to church is not all there is to being a Christian. And doing these things that God has prescribed for us to do and to do them in an authorized way and in an edifying way is not all there is to this matter of worship because I do believe that there is a second level of worship that involves our daily life. It involves what we do as we go about our lives each day. Worship as a way of life. Now I want to state this and I want you to hear this carefully. I don't believe assembly worship can be replaced with anything else. I don't believe that you can leave off assembly worship and be a faithful Christian. I don't believe that you can just come to the meeting house and put your mind in neutral and go through all the correct motions and say you've worshipped. You know, you can sit in a hen house, but that won't make you a chicken. You can sit in a church house, and it won't make a worshiper out of you. You can do a lot of things besides worship while you're here. But let me say, you must do those things, and you cannot get by without those things. But the spiritually minded Christian also understands that his whole life is a means of his worshiping God. And in that sense, worship doesn't end when the last amen is said and we leave the building. Worship is something that continues as I am devoting my life and dedicating every action and every thought in my life to the service of God. Now you may be saying, well, where in the world do you get that out of the scriptures? Well, here they are. Let me just suggest some of them to you. There are several different words in the original language of scripture, the Greek language, that are translated with different English words in your Bible. Sometimes the word worship will be one of those words. Sometimes the word service will be one of those words. Sometimes other words will be used like the word offering. And when you look at the way in which those words are used to begin with, may I suggest that you think about what Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3 would tell us when it uses this particular word which is quite often used actually in the New Testament, this word latruyo, which sometimes in some of our English Bibles will be translated as worship. Philippians 3 and verse 3, Paul said, We are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And what a latruyo, what that kind of worship involves is the idea of service and rendering a religious homage or service to God according to Vine's dictionary. But then if you want to look a little further you can go to Romans the 14th chapter in verses 13 through 18 and there's a, another Greek word that pops up there the word deluyo and that word of course is sometimes translated with the word serves but it's kind of interesting how Paul puts it in the 14th chapter of Romans beginning there at verse 13. Because he says that we should not judge one another anymore. But we should rather determine this not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in our brother's way. He said, I know and I'm convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean to him it is clean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you're no longer walking according to love. So do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. 
For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Pay attention here. Verse 18. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and is approved by men. And you know what he's teaching us in those verses we just read? That when you treat your brethren with respect, when you treat your brethren with deference, and when you recognize that you're not their judge, but that you are their brother, and that you both are going to answer to a judge that will rule on both of your circumstances, you recognize that as you treat your brothers with love, and you treat your brothers with compassion, you are serving Christ in doing that. And you are acceptable to God when you do that sort of thing. That's what he's telling us right there in verse 18. And then you can go across the page there to Romans the 15th chapter and look at verse 16. And he's talking there about some of the things he's written to the Roman brethren and some of the reminders that he's given them. And he was talking about the grace that God had given him. And he said that he was a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles that he ministered as a priest the gospel of God so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That word prosphora there means a bloodless sacrifice. That's what that means. It's the idea of what happened except there's no blood when they offered something to God on an altar and what Paul is saying is, is he's saying my work in preaching the gospel to the Gentiles is an offering to God. Oh, it's bloodless, all right. Nobody died. There wasn't anybody running around with a basin trying to collect blood that came from a slit throat somewhere. He said it's a bloodless sacrifice, but this is an offering, he said. These Gentiles that I'm preaching to is an offering that I am making to God, which I pray will be acceptable to him. Paul believed he was worshiping his God through his preaching efforts. The point is this. Paul, in preaching the gospel, glorified, magnified, honored, and showed respect for God in his preaching. And because of it, the Gentiles came to know God truly. So they could worship him in truth. So that they didn't have to be blind anymore. So that they didn't have to try to worship God in an ignorant way. And I will just have to say to all of you tonight that as a gospel preacher, I look at myself very frequently and ask this question, does my preaching do for people what Paul's preaching did for them? Do people glorify God as a result of what I teach them? Are they magnifying Christ as a result of what I'm saying to them? Paul's first concern, my friends, was not what they would think of him as a preacher. That was not the thing that was on Paul's mind at all. What he wanted to know is what are they going to think about God? He didn't want them to be impressed with the messenger. He wanted them to be impressed with the message. And let me just let you in on a secret here. The temptation runs strongly with preachers when preparing sermons to consider what the people are going to think of me when I'm finished preaching. There's not a preacher that's ever mounted a pulpit that wouldn't say that's a temptation. But that's not the goal of preaching. That's not what we're trying to achieve when we do that. A number of years ago, way back when, there was a reporter who once listened in London at the Metropolitan Tabernacle to a sermon preached by the great Charles Spurgeon, who was supposed to be one of the greatest preachers of his day. And he listened to Spurgeon preach on the crucifixion. And then a couple of weeks later, he'd come across the pond to New York City and over on the American shore, there was another preacher in New York City by the name of Henry Ward Beecher that everybody loved to hear. And people would just flock to that building in which he preached on Sundays. And then they'd sometimes take his sermons, believe it or not, and print them in the newspaper. Can you imagine uh, a, a circumstance in which people would do that with Ricky's lessons? Just say, send a reporter out, see what that guy's got to say, and let's put it in the newspaper here in Dallas so everybody can benefit from that. Things like that don't happen in our world. But when that reporter listened to Henry Ward Beecher and after having listened to Charles Spurgeon, somebody asked him what the difference was between those two preachers. And he said, I will tell you that when the people listened to Spurgeon preach, they remarked after he got finished, what a savior 
But when Beecher preached, the people would say, What a preacher! Which one of those men made an acceptable offering to God, assuming they preached the truth at all? But assuming that they preached the truth, which one of those men made an acceptable offering to God through his preaching? The one that everybody lauded as a great orator, or the one who thought the God he is preaching to us is greater than anyone that we could imagine? And I will tell you that I'm an abject failure as a preacher if I cannot point people to the Christ, if I cannot make them glorify God because of the teaching that I am giving them, and if it does not make them think more of God and more of His love and more of His mercy and more of His power, then I have failed in my mission as a preacher of Christ. And then, kind of surprisingly, in Philippians 4 and verse 18, this word, Thusia, pops up. And it's translated as sacrifice. And quickly, I won't read it, but it's a passage that has to say that the Philippians had made a sacrifice in supporting financially the Apostle Paul as he did his work as an evangelist. And they supported them. And he informed the Philippians that their fellowship with him was a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing to God. Paul's conscientious preaching and their support of that preaching was worship as far as he was concerned. In the 13th chapter of Hebrews in verses 15 and 16, that same word pops up again. And he says that those of us who are children of God should be people that are doing good for others and sharing and communicating is what the King James Version says. And he says that God is well pleased with such sacrifices when we're helping people, when we're meeting their needs, when we're taking care of things that they need from us. And I'm suggesting to us tonight that when we look at all of those scriptures, it may then be easier for us to really comprehend what is being said in the 12th chapter of Romans in verse 1, when he said, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. We're making a sacrifice to God, a bloodless one, yes, but a sacrifice that we're offering to God. It is a holy sacrifice, acceptable to God. It is our spiritual service of worship, the New American Standard says. And this business of just worship being what we do in those five acts on the Lord's Day is a little bit short-sighted, it seems to me. In fact, it'd be wonderful if that's all worship was. And I didn't have to worry about how I live Monday through Saturday. And I didn't have to worry about how I treat you and what... That does as far as my relationship to God. And whether or not I help support the preaching of the gospel, or whether or not I brought people to Christ, I'm telling you that every one of those things are things that tell us that our worship to God comes from spiritual hearts and minds. May I finish tonight by just getting to this passage? In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, he says, Whatever you do in word or deed, you do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. And then he said, Wives, you be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And husbands, you love your wives and do not be embittered against them. And children, you be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, don't exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. And slaves, in all things you obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. If you didn't catch all of that, let me highlight it for you. It's important that whatever we do, we recognize we're going to serve God or not serve Him. We're either going to bring glory to Him or dishonor to Him. And that's true if you're a husband, it's true if you're a wife, it's true if you're a child, it's true if you're a father, it's true if you're a mother, it's true if you're a servant, whatever you do, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve, even when you're dealing with your family. That's why it's impossible for people to live like the devil at home and come to church and act like they're somebody. You can't do that. You've got to live like you ought to live at home. 
And you've got to live like you ought to live at work. And you've got to live like you ought to live out on the baseball field. And I've seen some terrible behavior out of Christians on a ball field, haven't you? Oh, they led prayer Sunday, so wonderful. But man, they ate that umpire up. They chewed that coach up one side and down the other from those stands that day. How does that serve God, I ask you? How does that help glorify and honor the name of Christ when we get out in public and we misbehave? You see, it's an all or none proposition. Spiritually minded people are spiritually minded everywhere. In all circumstances, in every situation of life, their first question is, will this glorify God or will it dishonor Him? And if it dishonors Him, we leave it alone. We're not going to do anything that would denigrate the name of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. And I want to just finish by saying to you this evening this one thing. Worship is one of those things that you can't really offer unless you have first given yourself to God. You can't do it. You remember what Paul said to the Corinthians when he was bragging on the Macedonians and what kind of contribution they had made to the poor saints in Jerusalem and said, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. They contributed out of their poverty. And he was trying to encourage the Corinthians who apparently had a little more money to make good on a promise that actually made about helping those uh, brethren down in Judea that needed their help. And he used as an example those Macedonian brethren. And he said, they, they gave beyond their ability. They gave out of their poverty. But he said, I'll tell you why they did that. He said, they first gave themselves to the Lord. I've been in churches where folks were kind of fastidious about the business of passing the Lord's Supper and some fellow came in that they didn't know and, and they almost slapped his hand as he preached the Lord's Supper because you're not a member here. And, uh, you know, they don't like the idea that some guy who's not a member of the church, he might come to our singings, you know. And, oh, he wants to sing. I used to have a fellow that would come to singings, he wouldn't come to the preaching. But he'd come to the singings because he liked to sing and he enjoyed that. Well, I wouldn't want to tell him he couldn't come because he wanted to remember the church, but I will tell you this. In all practicality, any offering of worship to God that does not first involve me giving my life lock, stock, and barrel to God is going to be absolutely me. And when I decide that I'm going to give my heart to the Lord, and I'm going to repent of my sins, and I'm going to confess my faith in my Christ, and I'm going to be baptized for the remission of my sins. From that point forward, my worship takes on a whole new purpose and a whole depth of meaning that it could never have as long as I'm outside of Jesus Christ. It matters not how much money you might put into a collection. It matters not how much you might enjoy the singing. Matters not how much you'll be tolerant of the Bible teaching. The point is until you obey God, your worship can't be offered. Not accepted. So if I'm speaking to anybody tonight, at least make that right because you want to worship God. Well, that's great, but you've got to start at square one. And square one is get your heart right, get your relationship with God right. Do what God wants you to do. Even Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 6 that if you come to the altar and you're going to make your offering and while you're standing there you remember that you and your brother have a problem that hasn't been settled. He said you leave your offering right there. You go and you take care of that problem you've got with your brother. Then you come back and make your offering. And that'll be the right way to do that. You see it's first things first. And you've got to get your heart right and worship right. Many of us don't worship because our hearts are someplace besides where they need to be. You need to obey the gospel tonight. You need to have prayers offered in your behalf as a Christian. We stand ready to help you every word we can. And we encourage you to come. We stand